We will get ourselves started. We, we, uh, I, it, this was good positive energy in the room and I wanted to let some of that burn through and, and, uh, and I want to say thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, my name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president here at CSIS. Uh, I, uh, my role here today is ornamental uh, because fortunately we have real experts who are going to be leading this discussion and I'm delighted to have them here. My very sincere thanks to Dick Meserve and to Brent Scowcroft for being here. They're members of the commission. Mike Wallace, everybody at heard knows Mike, but Mike was really instrumental in this entire project. It would not have occurred without Mike Wallace's leadership, both his strategic leadership and tactical leadership at every session. And it was uh, a great privilege to be with you, Mike, and I want to say thank you. Um, let me just, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and say thanks to some very important leaders in this industry who are here today. And, uh, and uh, so let me, first of all, uh, Christine Svinicki, thank you. Delighted to have you here. It's it's really important that you'd be with us. Pete Lyons, or Pete Lyons, one of my heroes. Uh, <laughs> we'll work around Pete. Our paths have kind of gone like this for many years, and and uh, and I we're delighted that Pete would be with us today. Uh, really quite pleased. Uh, Vic Reese, Vic, same way. I mean, Vic is, Vic is a, he's a inside provocateur for. Our, Things nuclear, which is which is quite important. Joyce Connery, who was very s instrumental in every step along with this project. Joyce, of course, is the director of the nuclear energy policy inside the N uh, National Security Council staff, and we're really delighted she's here. Ed McGinnis, who is the deputy assistant secretary of international nuclear energy policy and cooperation. I want to say thank you for to Ed for coming. Annie uh, Caputo, who is with the Senate. Uh, Committee on the Environment and Public Works. I don't know, uh, where is Annie? Right there. Annie, you, I haven't met you before, so we'll talk. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Delighted you're here. John Welsh, who's here, who's with USEC, and I want to say thank you for John for being here. I see Dick Thornburg here, who is, Dick, of course, was, uh, was, uh, uh, governor in Pennsylvania some years back when we had a when we had an interesting nuclear experiment uh, which, which we all learned from uh, and it was <laughs> it was a euphemism but it was but it was uh, that was it, it showed at the time the importance of political leadership and he gave political leadership to the country when we needed it and it was really Really very important. Great to, that he would be here with us today. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm really just abusing my privilege here just as to be the host uh, to say a few words, but I, I feel very strongly uh, about this. Uh, you know, we're teetering on the edge of walking away from an industry I think we can't abandon. And I think we really do have to take this seriously. And it's uh, and it's, it's not because there's malevolence. It's not because there's, I think we've overcome the paranoia of Three Mile Island. But it's because we have an industry that's having to compete against $3 gas. And boy, is that, that's a headwind that you can't overcome. And it looks like we're going to have that for some time. Um, so it caused us to step back and to say, what, what, is this industry important? And why is this industry important? And I think you're going to hear about this from my colleagues today. I personally think America's national security demands that we stay a leader, a global leader, in nuclear energy. I'm going to let General Scowcroft, who can speak far more authoritatively than can I, on this role. It is crucial, but we have to think about it in this way. It cannot just simply be left to be a, an energy matter. Uh, I hate to say it, and so we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. We're also very very fortunate. Dick Meserve is with us. Dick has been in, if, uh, you know, he's of course he was chaired the NRC. He understands the imperative of of stewardship, stewardship to the public, stewardship to an industry, and those are that's just as important. Uh, and stewardship for the future, and so Dick will be speaking to that when he talks about it. And then and then Mike Wallace. Mike built the last operating nuclear power plant in America. Um, he's committed his life to trying to say that we can stay active in this leadership. And it's that sort of thing that's absolutely crucial. So it's important to have you here. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we can set up a commission, we can organize ourselves, but without 
a sounding board. We're just strings plucked in the wind. We need this sounding board. This is the group that's going to start amplifying a message that America needs to hear. So with that, let me get out of the way. And I think, uh, Mike, are you going to say a few words to Oregon? Are you gonna let, you're going to let General start right away. We're going to, we're going to let, uh, well, I, I could spend about a half hour introducing General Skolkoff to you, but that would be a waste of your time and certainly his as well. So would, would you all, with your applause, please welcome General Brent Skolkoff. Thank you very much, John. Uh, after I say a few words, the experts will take over and run the discussion. But uh, let, let me talk just a bit about the national security implications, because there, there are several that go in all in the same direction. But when we started the nuclear business, we were Mr. Nuclear. Uh, we were the pioneers. We understood it better than anybody else. We could explain it. Uh, we were the ones who could set the rules, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NPT. All of these things were U.S. generated because we were involved in every aspect of it. Uh, and unfortunately, that's eroding. And as that erodes, so does our ability to control things. You know, we, we set out the rules for handling nuclear materials and so on. We set them out first in the NPT, and then we figured out that the NPT really wasn't adequate enough because it, it basically said you can do anything you want in nuclear R&D as long as you don't intend to make nuclear weapons. Well, that's in geopolitics, that's not a very good way to do things. And so we are stuck right now with uh, Iran, for example, saying, nuclear weapons? We just want nuclear power. And we're, we're stuck trying to point out the things they're doing which indicate they do want nuclear weapons. But it's an awkward situation. Now, in the past, we could have fixed that easily. It's not so easy now. And as we have developed, we have figured out that one of the things that have is that the long pole in the tent of having nuclear weapons is really the fissile material rather than the technology of bombs. Now, if you want, okay, if you want a sophisticated weapon to fit on the front of a missile, that's one thing. But if you just want a nuclear explosion, then the, the key is to have the fissile material, which is either enriched uranium or reprocessed nuclear fuel. So you have to control that, and you have to control that for all of the countries, whether they, you think they might want nuclear weapons, or clearly simply want an avenue to nuclear power as an energy source. And that's the dilemma we're in now. So to deal with that, we set up the sort of 123 agreement system in order to get access to our technology advice and so on. You have to sign the 123 agreement, which says you will not enrich uranium, which says you will not reprocess fuel, all of those kinds of things. And that worked for a while. Doesn't work very well anymore because countries are starting to, to say, why should we sign that kind of restrictive agreement? We can go to the French, we can go to the Japanese, we can go to the Russians. We don't need to sign your doggone agreement because the technology is amply available everywhere. And that is an increasing problem for us. And it's one which our absence from the nuclear power scene is going to make critically worse. And there's no real alternative to it. In addition, uh, we, see, we heaved a great sigh of relief uh, at the development of shale gas. 
uh, from a national security perspective, what I see looming is at the end of our shale period, having put our head in the sand about energy, we will have a national security crisis that will make anything we're facing right now look minor. Uh, I, I think this is a, an almost cataclysmic situation, and it is, it is creeping up on us in a way which makes it hard for us to understand. And we look at all of these different pieces that I have described as if they were separate and distinct in and of themselves rather than as a pattern. We cannot maintain leadership in, nuclear, in the nuclear industry and leadership in preventing the spread of nuclear weapons if we're not players, because there are too many avenues now that countries can use to evade the kind of controls that we just took as a matter of course when we were dominant. And I'll s stop right there and uh, deal with any questions later you have. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to Richard Meserve, the chairman of the Carnegie Institute and the former chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and my colleague on a blue ribbon panel to deal with nuclear waste, which I'll let him comment on, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to speak with you today. Um, my role is to describe some of the recommendations that uh, we reached uh, in the course of this uh, study. As all of you, I hope, picked up on the way in, the full report is available in the background and a lot of the factual information is laid out there. But I thought for this group, which is, um, uh, I know many of you and are very influential and involved in the policy areas, it would probably be best to turn directly to the recommendations and to describe and discuss them. Um, as, uh, by way of an overview, <clears throat> I think the recommendations are intended to serve two principal purposes. First, there is the obligation, opportunity, the need to preserve nuclear energy for the usage in the United States. Um, as General Scrocroft and, and, uh, and John Hamry have indicated, we have the luxury now of very cheap natural gas. And as all of you know, there's been a huge surge in the reliance on natural gas to provide electricity production. We've seen this picture before, and that situation is likely to change. Uh, and we are going to wish that we had a broader portfolio of energy supply that is available to us. We need to have stable baseload power, and we need to have power that is carbon free. And you look at all of those alternatives, and it is, in my view, in the view of the report, that having a reliance on a, within the portfolio, maintaining a strong nuclear component is going to be important for our nation's energy security. But as General Scowcroft has indicated, there is a second dimension to this issue, which is not one that has received much attention before, and that is the international dimension uh, and the importance of a strong involvement with civilian nuclear power in order to achieve our international objectives in safeguards, and safety, and security. And that if we're going to have influence abroad, we need to be in the game. Uh, we're not going to set the rules if we're not in the game. So there's a second element to the recommendations that deals particularly with those focus. We have a diverse set of recommendations. This reflects the fact that there is no silver bullet that solves all the problems. Uh, that there's a range of things that need to be done. Our recommendations obviously focus on things the government can do, but there are parallel obligations for industry with help from the government to step to the plate and develop technologies that meet our needs that are saleable abroad uh, and that uh, fulfill the obligations to make sure that we maintain adequate safety and security. So 
What we envision and propose in this report is a multifaceted program that has uh, many dimensions, and I will sort of walk through the sort of various clusters of areas in which there are recommendations in the report. The first is the need to bolster U.S. competitiveness in export markets. With low natural gas prices, it's going to be very hard to build very many new nuclear plants in the United States. Uh, there are other countries that are building now. There are many countries that have not involved in nuclear power that have expressed interest in pursuing nuclear power, and there is an opportunity for maintaining U.S. influence by making sure that we can export and be involved with them in their nuclear programs and thereby have influence with them. Uh, we recommend a series of, uh, of recommendations in this area. Uh, one is the importance, as General Scowcroft has indicated, of the 123 agreements. Those are agreements that relate to the Section 123 of the Atomic Energy Act that provide the cooperation agreements between the U.S. and foreign governments. Uh, and we recommend uh, the case-by-case -case negotiation of those agreements. There has been discussion from time to time, uh, and some have pursued the idea of a so-called gold standard for 123 agreements, where we would require anybody who enters into cooperation with us that they commit that they will not forever, will forego enrichment and reprocessing. That's not any part of any international treaty they have reached. And since we don't control the technology anymore, if we demand that kind of agreement, we're just taking ourselves out of the game with our capacity to influence them. So we urge that, that this is an area in which there should be sort of case-by-case -case adjustment and work out what you can, but involve yourself with these countries so that we can influence the trajectory of their applications of nuclear technology. We also have a recommendation for a revision of the 810 requirements. These are part 810. 10 CFR. These are the uh, Department of Energy regulations that govern the export of technology. Um, there is an effort that's underway to re-examine those regulations and try to make sure that, well, assuring adequate control of the technology, they simultaneously don't impose a significant burden on, on exports, a needless burden on exports. And there's been a lot of discussion and interaction with the administration on the pursuit of developing appropriate 810 requirements. And uh, then finally, there is a role of generally of working as a country and sort of a Team America approach to support exports and to streamline the whole export approval process. Some other countries with whom we compete for the sale of uh, nuclear technologies have, you know, processes where in 15 to 90 days they can get all the clearance that are necessary and where we're taking over a year then we just take ourselves from the, out of the game because of the timelines that we need to, to the, the timelines involved with our decision process. Now, this has to be done carefully. I don't deny that. But if there's ways to streamline the process to make it more efficient, that's obviously in our interest because of the national security role that I've described, that we need to be involved with these countries and we need to remove needless barriers in pursuing uh, exports. The second uh, set of recommendations has to do with expanding support for the technology. We focus on small modular reactors where there is an opportunity for the United States uh, in both export markets and within the United States to have a role uh, in what could be a very important market both within the world and within the United States. There is, a, I think as many of you know, there is a major DOE program that's underway with uh, uh, support of about $450 million to support the licensing of, a, uh, of um, two different SMR uh, contractors. Um, that's a cost-shared program. Uh, it's modeled on work that had been undertaken uh, uh, for the large reactors that uh, resulted in things like the AP-1000 being licensed. Uh, and that, that program is underway. There is now the next step to be taken in order to pursue the development and demonstration program to make that whole system real. So uh, we recommend that there be some financial and financial and structuring incentives. It has to be one where the appropriate load is carried both by the government and by the private sector. 
Uh, and uh, there is an opportunity in particular within the Department of Defense and within DOE for its own uh, needs to have a reliance on SMRs, that having in particular in DOD, there is an obvious and strategic interest in having off-grid capability with reactors at a scale that's appropriate for the demand for electricity, and small modular reactors have the promise of achieving that. And there is an opportunity that, that with sufficient orders you can drive down the cost of the SMRs through factory production, through learning curve processes that you can make this a very competitive technology. At least that's the hope. It needs to be proven, but um, there's a real promise, and this is a technology in which the United States at the moment really has very strong capacities. That there are some excellent companies that are involved in the pursuit of SMR technology. With regard to the longer term, uh, we encourage the pursuit of a government research development and demonstration programs for advanced nuclear technologies for the long, further out technologies. Um, we're going to be relying on light water reactors in the United States for a long time. Some of the SMRs that have some advanced ideas that could be pursued as well. But there's a whole bunch of technologies that we would like to have the option to pursue in the future. Uh, the third uh, area where we have recommendations is to expand particip U.S. participation in international nuclear cooperation. <clears throat> Uh, I may be prejudiced in my statement now, but I think that in my interactions internationally, I can say that the NRC is viewed as providing basically an exemplar for the world on appropriate nuclear regulation. I was struck when I was the chairman of the NRC that I would, dealing with other countries, is how frequently other countries would look to us to give them guidance as to how to proceed and to look to us as to set the path for them for the steps they should take to ensure nuclear safety. The Institute for Nuclear Power Operations, one of the more important outcomes from the Three Mile Island accident, was uh, similarly is, sets a model for the world for industry self-policing of its activities in the pursuit of excellence uh, in safety. So we really have a dimension of our government with which nearly every other country in the world every other country in the world sees as a model for them of what they would like to achieve. And there's an opportunity there for us to interact with them in productive ways uh, that expands American influence, but in areas that are sign significantly important to us. This becomes, I think, very important right now because there's a whole series of countries, as I mentioned earlier, that do not currently rely on nuclear power but have indicated an intention to pursue nuclear power. There were many of these countries that came forward before the Fukushima accident. Some of them backed off or paused for a while, but there's a large group of them have decided to forge ahead now at high speed. There are reactors that are under construction in the United Arab Emirates. We have countries uh, like Jordan, uh, uh, that uh, Nigeria, Malaysia, Vietnam, Turkey, Poland. There's a whole range of countries that don't currently have nuclear power plants that have indicated an intention to build them and are in various stages of the process of the pursuit of nuclear power. They have a very grave challenge they confront, that there are obligations that they have to satisfy in safety, security, and safeguards. And if they fail, they're going to impact nuclear power everywhere. And it is important, I think, to all those involved in the nuclear enterprise, not only in the United States but internationally, to be fully involved with these countries to make sure they understand their responsibilities in the first place. But secondly, that we help them provide the capabilities so that they can fulfill those obligations. And they need help and guidance in both those areas. So there's, a, there is a, there's an important role for the United States as part of this process, working with others and through, in part through in various international organizations to facilitate the capacity of these countries to meet their obligations successfully. Finally, uh, uh, well not finally, but another cluster of recommendations has to do with the waste challenge. Um, the report recommends the implementation of the various recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission, which 
General Scowcroft was the very able co-chairman of that effort. I had the good fortune to work with him uh, as part of that process. Uh, you know, there are a cluster of recommendations to develop a consent-based approach to siting, develop a new management organization to pursue the back end of the fuel cycle, providing access to the waste fund to uh, pay for the ongoing work rather than to have to rely on congressional appropriations for everything every year, prompt efforts to develop disposal facilities, prompt efforts to develop storage facilities, preparing for the transport of spent fuel and high-level waste, supporting innovation uh, and workforce development, which we cover in another of our recommendations. And again, this issue will be about taking leadership in international efforts. My perspective is that these recommendations are one that are, I, I can't claim, that they necessarily all were new, uh, but they've been assembled by the Blue Ribbon Commission, um, and I think and hope that they provide a productive foundation on which we can develop an approach for dealing with uh, our waste issues in a way that we have failed in the past. Uh, and obviously this is a thorn in the side of nuclear power. It's one that has been too long in being fixed and the Blue Ribbon Commission uh, has provided a path forward that seems to be generally acceptable. And the, uh, this report that you'll read strongly encourages that those recommend recommendations be pursued. We uh, recommend as well that there be economic support for new U.S. reactors. Uh, you know, as you know, there are four of the new designs that are under construction right now in South Carolina and in Georgia, two each in those states. Uh, if there are going to be others, there are, as John Hamry indicated at the beginning, there's a real challenge in building new nuclear plants at a time of such low natural gas prices that basically beats everything in terms of cost of power. Uh, there's a benefit from a portfolio point of view and from an environmental point of view in having nuclear power be maintained as a part of the mix. If that's going to be achieved. We need to have policies in place to enable construction to occur. Among the recommendations are to lower the cost of borrowing, um, an issue with which I know Mike Wallace has uh, greater familiarity than uh, he would like. Uh, there are issues associated with dealing with foreign investment in new uh, nuclear construction. There is a, a provision in the Atomic Energy Act that serves as a bar today. Uh, and it's being very uh, vigorously uh, pursued to staff level at the NRC in ways that can inhibit investment. There are opportunities to revise the tax code in the way of investment tax credits and accelerated appreciation. And at some stage, we need to find a way to include and monetize the benefits of nuclear power in the pricing somehow. I mean, that there are obviously benefits in terms of the environmental role, and I'm talking particularly about climate change here, that one way or another we need to recognize. And so all of those things will uh, help to make new nuclear construction more competitive within the United States. How much is enough? Whether it's enough is something that, uh, that is examined in the report. It's a hard challenge uh, to confront at a time where we have natural gas prices where they are. Um, it's recommendations as well for improving internal government policy coordination. Uh, there's a recommendation for a focus within the government, within the administration for interagency coordination, uh, perhaps involving a cabinet secretary is uh, taking the uh, leadership on this. Uh, Ernie Manese would be a perfect uh, selection for that uh, process. And there simultaneously is an opportunity for more focused oversight within the Congress where the responsibility for oversight is scattered all over in various ways that can inhibit, it, inhibit it, a coordinated approach to, uh, uh, to various policy matters that affect nuclear. And then we have recommendations as well as the need to and develop a future nuclear workforce. Uh, we need to invest in education and training and general workforce development. These are skilled jobs, they're high paying jobs. There are opportunities here, uh, not only for domestic construction, but if we can maintain a, an export capacity, there, is, there are opportunities here that are well worth pursuing and will be part of the overall objectives that we uh, seek to achieve. 
And there are opportunities as well that to, to enhance this through a variety of different agencies that have programs to help on workforce development, prominently involving the NRC and the DOE, but others are engaged in this exercise as well. Um, so that's a really quick rush through a diverse range of recommendations that come out of the report. Uh, the bottom line uh, is that a wide variety of actions are necessary to maintain U.S. leadership in uh, nuclear energy, and we ought to get moving on implementing them. So with that, let me turn this over to Mike Wallace, and I'll give him the opportunity to correct any of my, my summary of the recommendations since he's been principally responsible for preparation of this report. Uh, thanks, Dick. Uh, I wouldn't say principally, I'd say just one of many people who have been involved in, in this effort. And frankly, I look around the room and recognize a number of you as having been engaged with a number of the sessions we've held over the past two years. So what I'd like to do in my remarks is you've heard a bit about the uh, national security imperative from General Scowcroft's perspective. We wanted to get quickly to the recommendations, which Dick just uh, ticked through. And I'll now step back and set a little more context as to how we got here with this report. Uh, I'll be a bit redundant in hitting through the challenges once again, but then I'm also going to lay out uh, the direction that CSIS and the Nuclear Energy Program will be undertaking uh, from here forward. Um, as many of you who know me know I've been in this business for as long as these guys have, 40 years, and I think it's fair to say that this has never been an industry for the faint of heart, uh, whether it goes back to the, uh, to the events in Pennsylvania in 1979 or the 80s or the 90s uh, or uh, the subsequent activities following 9-11. Uh, it's always been a technology that has been challenging uh, and that demanded great respect. And it seems ironic in many ways that we find ourselves where we are today in that, building on Dick's comments, we have, beyond a doubt, the best operating nuclear plants in the world. And people come from outside to understand how we do it. Safety, reliability, and economics. Uh, in as much as that can be controlled. That wasn't the case. And there were times in the 90s when I well remember a number of countries in Europe uh, being uh, partners that I looked to to find out how to do it. And, and today, that's sort of flip side around. Uh, literally everybody comes to the U.S. to learn how to operate. Second, to Dick's point, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is without doubt the number one recognized top regulator in the world for nuclear energy. Uh, and they share their experiences. And that's uh, something that constitutes a basis for people having confidence in the U.S.'s nuclear energy program. And the third leg, born out of Three Mile Island, is IMPO, which Dick men mentioned, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. Uh, today, that is well recognized as the self-regulating approach for an industry to take itself to very, very high standards in the so-called pursuit of excellence. And other industries are looking to learn from how IMPO has been able to do what it did. And it wasn't always that way. In the 80s and 90s, uh, it was under challenge frankly, by many of us in the industry, maybe myself included, uh, as to what role they really had when we already had a, a rather significant independent regulator. But today, the coordinated roles of the operators, the regulator, and IMPO are well understood to constitute the three legs, if you will, of the stool that takes us to a level uh, that is the, uh, the envy of many others around the world and the model uh, that many are seeking to follow. The ultimate result shows up in the safety and the economics of our nuclear plants and the confidence that people have in our ability to do it, do that. So the irony is exactly at the time that we find ourselves at the pinnacle of, uh, or some pinnacle in any event, of excellence, uh, we also find ourselves uh, on a road to decline. 
I, for one, can tell you that when we started this project two years ago, I never contemplated I'd be here today and having to recognize that instead of 104 operating nuclear units, we have 100 nuclear units operating. And moreover, below the surface, there are a lot uh, there that are economically challenged. It's, it's a good news, bad news story. We are absolutely blessed uh, with the shale gas uh, uh, benefits uh, that that's brought to our energy and, and, and should bring to our economy. Uh, and so there's, there's no, nothing but uh, praise and recognition of good things that goes with the low gas prices, but it has produced an enormous economic challenge that in my 40 years is beyond anything we've, we've seen previously. So we started uh, just over two years ago uh, in a session, and uh, as I recall, I know General Scowcroft was there, and I think uh, Dick was there as well. About 30 thought leaders in and out of government uh, came together uh, to discuss fundamentally two questions, and I say two questions because the general was the person who narrowed it down after three hours to say we have two questions here we really need to seek to answer. Does nuclear energy in the United States matter? Don't put zealotness in front of what we're doing. Does it matter? If it does, does U.S. leadership in nuclear energy globally matter? Truly does it matter? And those were the two questions we started out to answer uh, two years ago. In the intervening period of time, we held uh, 14 different venues, combination of either commission meetings uh, or sessions here at CSIS, all of which were invitation only and Chatham House rule, because we sought to get on the table uh, the most direct, candid input we could get about the situation surrounding nuclear energy in the U.S. Does it matter, and if so, why? And does our leadership matter? And then as we got on farther, and so what do we do about that? We formed the commission itself in September of 2011, about five months into the process. And you can see in the report who the members of the commission were. Uh, and they followed the progress of our sessions and that the drafting of the report, which was based on uh, the input that we received along the way, and while I don't know the exact number, I'm sure well over 100 participants uh, were part of our sessions along the way providing input. Uh, and for uh, uh, many of the more notable contributors, you'll see their, their names and you'll see their corporations identified at the end of the, uh, end of the report. We sought to get all stakeholder input uh, from literally every angle to try and understand the subject in the best way that we could. And in so doing, the, the view that there was a national security imperative did not come out at all in the beginning. It came out much more about three quarters of the way through as we were beginning to draw together why does it matter. And some of the aspects of it that uh, people like me in the commercial industry never really thought about started to come more and more to the table. Uh, and both the more direct national security implications as well as some of the more subtle implications came to the table. And I'll touch on a, a couple of those here as, as we go forward. So we are bringing the report forward uh, now with its perspective on the national security basis for nuclear energy, uh, with, uh, if you will, a summary of the challenges that nuclear energy faces, uh, and with a series of recommendations. Uh, and there are no silver bullets or brass bullets or wooden bullets or any kind of bullets uh, to try and, and, and deal with this. This is a very, very multifaceted, uh, tough uh, issue for us to deal with. But that is what we do best in this country, is the toughest problems seem to be when we come the most together and the creative thinking and the will of the American people and the Congress and the administration frequently come together to move us in, the, in a direction that is for the good of the country. 
Uh, and our, our effort here is intended to capture this moment and not let it go unaddressed so that we are putting forth the best approach, whatever that is, uh, that can be considered in the steps that we might take. Let me touch a little more on the challenges, and then I'm going to come to the, uh, the way forward from a CSIS perspective as well. The challenges fall into both the export markets and the domestic markets, and we've broken, and broken them out uh, that way in the report. Dick addressed them from the point of view of the recommendations. Those recommendations were seeking to address situations that we found as we went through a review of uh, domestic market and export market. For the export market, perhaps the single most important opportunity that U.S. companies with products and services have is to be able to move into the global marketplace and participate in trade and compete around the globe while we have uh, at the least a hiatus, if not a decline, going on in the nuclear industry in the United States. To deal with that, we have challenges with our nuclear trade agreements, uh, well recognized and for which there's been significant debate so that entities, companies are able to conduct trade uh, globally. We have challenges with the competitiveness of our companies. Uh, in many ways, the competition is turning into companies versus countries. And U.S. companies have a very difficult time effectively competing with countries uh, when countries have an extraordinarily close connection to their supply chain. In many cases, as you all know, it's, it's a part of uh, the government entities. And where it's not part of the government entities, uh, the economic support uh, that's provided for companies in other countries who are competing can be rather extraordinary. So the companies versus countries competition is a tough one for those who are trying to market U.S. products and services. We have challenges with uh, the complex, burdensome, and, and somewhat time-consuming export controls. Uh, the 110, Part 110 issues with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Part 810 issues with the Department of Energy, the regulations at the Department of Commerce. Uh, but I think part of the recognized good news there is in the two years that our report has been unfolding, just to give one example, uh, the Part 810 requirements in the Department of Energy have been advancing forward to where we understand uh, the new draft rule reflects much of the input that has been provided by industry um, along the way. Uh, and we're, we're hopeful that as that comes together, it facilitates easier um, processing of requests through DOE, where we also understand there are process reviews underway in order to create more expedited and transparent uh, visibility to the process. That's the sort of creative thinking uh, that we need. It, it's one area of many, but it's a good example of where things are moving uh, in a positive uh, direction. <clears throat> we have competition in technological competence. Uh, and uh, this is almost a, an upside down issue for me, having been in the nuclear Navy long, long time ago, uh, when we were the ones who, if you will, had the technology for the world and were providing the technology to the world. Uh, we now find ourselves technologically disadvantaged in some cases because technology is developing so fast in so many other countries. And so how we seed uh, SWD uh, technology competence within the U.S. so that we have products and services to sell uh, is a part of our challenge. Efforts are underway to help in that area. Uh, but much, much more needs to be done to unleash uh, the creativity that the U.S. marketplace in nuclear energy really can provide. And besides the impact that all of that can have on trade opportunities, 
The reality is if we are important as nuclear trade partners internationally, then our ability to influence the standards and norms for safety, security, operations, emergency response, and nonproliferation are strong. Leadership does matter, was our conclusion. And if our leadership wanes, our ability to influence evaporates, and that is most definitely going to prove contrary to the national security interests of the United States. So that reality needs to be in the forefront as a part of our objective in addressing the issues to facilitate greater U.S. leadership internationally. So what about the domestic scene? We have a challenge or two here, too, uh, that we need to address. Um, what I would say, some of the domestic challenges can and should be addressed. Others, frankly, are a function of the free marketplace uh, that is the epitome of the economic system that we operate in. Uh, and there is no one uh, that would suggest distortion to the free marketplace for the sake of nuclear energy. Frankly, what we might suggest is uh, a leveling of other distortions that some other technologies enjoy that work to the disadvantage of uh, nuclear energy. And importantly, and this is a relatively new thought, and Dick hit on it, uh, the consideration of the national interest benefits of nuclear energy need to be brought into the equation as the government considers what steps it might take to facilitate the viability of nuclear energy going forward, particularly the viability to sustain the fleet that we have today. And some of those national interests are, are really um, not so visible, even to those of us who've been around for a long time. The commercial industry has operated very independently of the defense side of the house. And that means both naval propulsion as well as matters related to nuclear weapons. Well, we are more recognizing that there are interrelationships, subtle in some cases, between the viability of our commercial nuclear energy and the viability of our naval propulsion and the expertise that we have in the weapons side as well. And if we are to stay as prominent as we are in the world in naval propulsion and in our ability to set standards and norms for weapons, we need infrastructure to support their missions. And some of that infrastructure comes right back to the commercial sector as well. In a sort of odd way, commercial nuclear energy has been funding some of the infrastructure that has allowed naval propulsion and even our weapons establishment to go forward. I'm a product of that. I got into nuclear power in the Navy, submarines, right out of the, uh, the box from college with the thought that if I didn't want to stay in the Navy, there was this wide open field of nuclear power that was growing very, very fast. So I had an immediate option on the table. And I might say probably all my colleagues who were in uh, the nuclear Navy at that point in time had the same perspective. Some stayed in and made the Navy their careers. Many of us chose to not stay in and came out uh, for the sake of being in commercial nuclear energy. I wonder how that is going to be looked on uh, by those who are just moving into the Navy establishment as young ensigns today and, and looking at where our industry stands. So there is more than a subtle connection that is going to start to show up. Domestic challenge, nuclear waste management. So much has been said about that. The real experts are next to me. I'm not going farther down that path. That is a challenge we can and should address uh, in the U.S. And it would make a big difference uh, for the viability, uh, sustainability of our current fleet. The cost of new plants and the economics associated with both new plants and existing plants 
is a real challenge. Uh, there are limited opportunities to directly impact that. Uh, we well recognize the financial environment that our government uh, needs to operate within, uh, and there is certainly no silver bullet from a financial point of view, but among the recommendations that Dick went through are some which are not so burdensome uh, that could truly help uh, in the area of economics. Regulation. I mentioned how we're so fortunate that the NRC has the regulatory reputation that it does, and it's warranted, uh, but we need to recognize that to the extent we have regulatory uncertainty or instability, that is particularly difficult at a time when commercial nuclear energy in the U.S. needs to have a clear path forward. Further, to the extent there are regulations that are burdensome without a commensurate benefit to safety, uh, they simply put further economic pressure on an industry that is already strained. None of us in the industry will or would ever be against regulations that are actually in the interest of improving nuclear safety. That's how we got to where we are. But they need to be regulations that are commensurate, commensurate with the benefits that they produce. And then finally, public opinion. Um, I, we're fortunate that we have still strong public opinion in the U.S., much stronger than many other countries around the world that have large nuclear fleets. Um, and I find it also ironic, perhaps at this point in time, that that public opinion is uh, augmented by environmental leaders who are more and more coming out publicly in favor of nuclear energy because of the clean air benefits that it produces to climate concerns. Uh, so recognizing how the general public and even those who were at times were not so favorably disposed to our technology looked on us and capturing that view for the sake of policymakers and the decisions they need to make uh, is going to be important. So that's a little bit of the how we got here and the challenges over the past two years, all captured in the report that you now uh, have with you. Um, with the issuance of this report, uh, we at CSIS will now close, if you will, the U.S. Nuclear Energy Project, which is what we started it, started uh, all this as two years ago, and we are transitioning to the CSIS Nuclear Energy Program. So the, the work of CSIS will continue and move forward uh, in ways where we seek to continue to collaborate with industry, government, and non-government entities to further address these challenges and, and move forward, providing insights and policy recommendations in as objectively developed a manner as we can in the way that CSIS is uh, well-renowned for how it does business. Specifically, as we go forward, we're going to focus our, our efforts on advancing two broad objectives, sustainability of the existing fleet and developing nuclear energy for the future. Now, that said, there are four specific areas wherein we, we will be seeking to facilitate discussion and collaboration. Let me just say a bit about each of those four areas. First area, we're going to follow up on the work that we've done and that's codified in this report. This is not a report that goes on the shelf, is done, and we slam the cover shut and don't get into. Uh, we consider it ripe with information. Uh, we consider the recommendations poignant, uh, and we consider it hopefully a reasonable basis for education and discussion among many policy makers going forward as we try to identify the challenges today and the scenarios which stand to be all too likely 
in the 2030 and 2050 timeframes. It's out of consideration for what 2030 or 2050 could look like uh, that we hope policymakers take most focus about the need to move today. Some of the areas within the present report that we did not have time to get into much detail on, barely touch, but which we find most significant, we're going to be exploring in more detail. For example, the contribution of nuclear energy to the stability and the reliability of the electricity grid. We, we touched on that. We had experts who worked with us on that, but we didn't really in detail explore that issue. We think that's quite important to be explored. Nuclear energy provides baseload power, as you all know, 24-7, 365 for 20 percent uh, of our electricity. What is the impact of that declining? Moreover, what is the impact of that going away? And what does it do to the electricity grid for stability and for reliability? That's one of the areas from the present report that we'll take forward and presume that may lead to some policy recommendations down the road. The second area of focus that we're going to have at CSIS going forward is on SMRs, small modular reactors. Uh, Dick talked just a little bit about that. It was only late in our project that we started to get into the SMR focus. We recognize it in the report as a recommendation based on it, but we didn't, if you will, have the uh, ability to deeply focus uh, resources on how to advance it forward. Certainly the industry and the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission are all taking steps to facilitate uh, SMRs going forward. Um, we have actually already begun uh, with uh, involved stakeholders in that area to advance the understandings on how to think about small modular reactors. Um, they have the potential to meet domestic needs for clean air energy and think not only today but for electricity demand growth, something that is not often put in high focus, but if our electricity needs continue to grow even modestly in the environment we're otherwise talking about, how are those going to be? adequately addressed. And then there are a number of issues with SMRs that stand to contribute to the reliability of the grid in the face of wide-scale uh, cyber disruptions or natural disasters. I, I like to frequently remind people that in a nuclear power plant, the fuel for the plant uh, is in the vessel. Today it's in there for about 18 months. In some SMRs it may be in there for four years or more. Uh, for a coal plant, the fuel is on the coal pile, usually 30 to 60 days. For a gas plant, beyond 24 or 36 hours, it's still in the ground someplace. And we don't even know where. And it's the transportation system that is extraordinarily vulnerable in assuring that the fuel is delivered in order for the gas plants to operate. So nuclear energy has an inherent stability that it can bring to the electricity grid. Uh, and SMRs, as a smaller size, have many applications. Uh, one of the lead applications that we're studying uh, is going to be with the Department of Defense and federal facilities uh, as a way to meet uh, the needs to assure uh, stability and uh, availability of supply on our bases, but doing it in a uh, NRC licensed uh, nuclear owner operator sort of uh, arrangement uh, with partnerships that come together. We'll be advancing the dialogue on SMRs into the fall. It's the most principal topic uh, of the four I'm going into uh, that we have right now. Third area that we'll be going into, John Hamry referred to, the nuclear ecosystem. Nuclear ecosystem is a term we've coined to describe the broad network that defines the nuclear energy sector and what it means to the American economy, 
uh, as well as to the defense establishment and all the links among the supply chain, products, services, universities, uh, all of the infrastructure that it takes for both the defense side to work and the commercial side uh, to work. Uh, we seek to better understand. It's not currently mapped. It's not well understood by anyone. And our effort is going to be to work in close co collaboration with stakeholders to develop that map in order to create a model that will help us see what the ripple effect stands to be of a significant decline in nuclear energy, commercial nuclear energy in the U.S. Moreover, uh, with the total decline of nuclear energy in the U.S., what stands to be the impact on the nuclear ecosystem? And in consideration of the defense side and the weapons side, if commercial nuclear energy goes away, what are the alternative steps that they would have to take in order to assure stability of uh, products and services and infrastructure to maintain their missions. Fourth area that we will be putting some effort into as well, we refer to as the global, global nuclear energy infrastructure. And fundamentally, we're recognizing there that 50 years ago, there were only a few countries that had nuclear energy and they were fully vertically integrated in the way that was done. Today, 31 countries have nuclear energy. About 30 more have expressed interest to adapt it for the first time. And at least by the IAEA estimate, 15 of those countries uh, are likely to produce nuclear energy on their soil for the first time by 2030. A lot of activity is going forward uh, in, in those areas. When they go forward, they're not all vertically integrated. Rather, they're getting parts, services, advice, people from an infrastructure that is global. And we see concerns to assure that high standards are maintained in the global infrastructure in order to create the framework for those countries and their nuclear plants to be able to operate to high standards of safety, security, operations, emergency response. So we'll be, we'll be seeking to work on that as a further phase of our efforts at CSIS. We see an outgrowth of that as the opportunity to help host countries who are trying to think through their strategic policy considerations in order to facilitate nuclear energy uh, moving forward. So to wrap up with the issuance of this report, we're really seeking to lay the foundation for more work that needs to be done. We can't do everything at once. We're going to take things in a stepwise fashion, just as our colleagues at Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as well need to do. But we're going to try and focus on those issues, matters, recommendations that can produce the most benefit in the shortest period of time, both to sustain the fleet that we have today, as well as to build, uh, if you will, support for developing nuclear energy for the future. So in obvious summary to the title on the report, we believe it is necessary to restore U.S. leadership in nuclear energy, and we believe it is a national security imperative. And it's on that tenant that we're going to be moving forward. So with that, I'm going to close the formal part of our program, if you will. Recognize we're well ahead of time, uh, which as a nuke, it's always a good thing. Uh, but we're going to transition into a comment and question period for a little bit, uh, and we'll, we'll give uh, uh, people in the audience an opportunity to express any views on what you've heard or what you know of our report, uh, or for that matter, ask any questions of the three of us at this point in time. So if you'd uh, like to say something, please identify yourself and your affiliation and uh, uh, the person to whom you may want to direct your comments or questions if there is one. And I think uh, 
I recognize uh, Vince Reese, Vic Reese. Microphone coming around, Vic. So I'm Vic Reese. I'm the internal provocateur at the Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, I'd like to add just one, my you know compliments. This is really a terrific job, and you know hit about just all the important points. But let me add one more suggestion in terms of looking forward, and that was brought up, I think, by General Scowcroft in his initial uh, discussions. And this goes back to the whole idea of uh, a few leasing and take back, uh, which I think uh, if I go back to a, 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 a very good um, uh, op-ed was written by uh, Scowcroft uh, Perry, uh, uh, I think it was Ash Carter and the late Arnie Cantor back in the New York Times and was followed up, I think, some years later by uh, John Deutsch, uh, Ernie Moniz, Again, the, uh, Arnie Cantor and Dan Poneman, all of many of whom now are still in, in a position to actually do something about that. And that's the relationship between interim storage, which again, the, the, the Blue Ribbon Commission came up very strongly, and the ability to do take back uh, and, and then push forward a, a fuel leasing. I think it's something that a CSIS uh, can it really add a lot to it's a very it's a, again it's a very difficult subject but I think it's a very important one because it isn't just a question of the U.S. returning retaining influence around the world which I think is fundamental to your your approach but also is okay now that I have that influence what do I do with it as well as selling you know as well as selling and providing standards it's also I think to help the NPT move to a more uh, to a uh, uh, a, a game, if you will, or the, the set the rules of the game that are applicable, you know, to the future, not just where we are now, but essentially where the future is. So let me suggest that that's something you put on your list of things to, to do in the future. Got it, Vic. Thanks very much. That was uh, a really good input. General, do you have any comment on that? Well, as usual, uh, it was a great input. And... Uh, I would like to see us move in the direction of what I would call internationalizing the fuel cycle. Uh, and, and that is for all the aspiring countries that want nuclear power, <clears throat> there would be a central storage location for enriched uranium. They would lease it. After it's burned, they would return it uh, and thus eliminate both the enrichment danger and the reprocessing dangers that we face uh, in, the, in the world today. And I, th you know, there are a lot of complications to it. It needs some work, but I don't see anything going forward on the notion now, and I think it's a great idea. Pete, did you have a comment? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, let me start by uh, certainly complimenting the panel and based on the uh, and, and see us. Pardon? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. You? Who are you? There's a some folks may not sorry. know you, Pete. <laughs> sorry, Pete Lyons at the Department of Energy. Just wanted to start by by complimenting the panel and. Uh, if the, uh, if the tidbits of the report that you shared with us are any indication of what's in this document, I, uh, I'm going to be a very avid reader of, uh, of this report starting tonight. Um, I very much appreciated the comments that recognize uh, nuclear power as a truly unique source of power. It's clean, but that's not unique. But you've emphasized, um, perhaps in Mike's comments, um, that it is unique from the standpoint of baseload power, scalable, um, highly, highly reliable. And then General Scowcroft, in, in your comp comments, emphasizing the, the vital national security and nonproliferation role, which I, I couldn't agree with more. Um, I completely agree that the United States must have a, ta have, have a seat at the international table where all the different aspects of nuclear technologies are discussed, debated, and refined, and we, we must be recognized as a leader. 
I think, Mike, you referred to it as a national security imperative, and I couldn't agree more. I think uh, Dick referred to, or, or at least mentioned, that um, in Dr. Moniz, we have a most unique um, Secretary of Energy, uh, someone who truly for decades has been recognized as a world leader in many aspects of energy, but specifically in nuclear energy. Um, he's certainly a very busy person now. He was before, too, but he's very busy now. As he's starting to find time to speak out, though, you're seeing nuclear energy and the issues that you've described figuring into a number of his comments. And um, certainly on a personal note, I couldn't be, uh, couldn't be happier with the uh, opportunity to, to look forward to working with him. Um, you pointed out the sobering challenge of natural gas. I don't have a great answer for that. It's, as you said, it's a, it's a mixed, it's, there, there's certainly great aspects of it. Uh, and there's certainly great challenges that uh, the natural gas um, provides. The good news is we have five plants under construction. That was emphasized. Uh, the challenge is that with natural gas, it's going to be hard to see a lot more. I, I guess I just note that um, as uh, w within my own office and in an extraordinary, extraordinarily austere budget environment, um, you mentioned SMRs. We're certainly trying to, to push to encourage the SMRs. I personally look forward to the studies that uh, CSAS and Mike that you'll be leading on SMRs. I don't see the SMRs as replacing the big plants, but I do see them as offering a potentially completely new paradigm to how we think about nuclear power and to enabling nuclear power in many, many areas in the United States as well as internationally where it would have been very hard to, to think about. So within that austere budget, we're certainly doing our best to support uh, now one, and we anticipate it will be two shortly, um, designs moving forward for um, design certification. And then I guess um, I just close my comments by showing my appreciation for the comments, um, while Dick probably mentioned them more than the others, as did Mike, on um, the importance of the back end of the fuel cycle. The work that the Blue Ribbon Commission accomplished, led by General Scowcroft, with Dick's able assistance, I think lays out a blueprint that is, to me, it's absolutely vital for the future of the country. I started my public service 44 years ago at Los Alamos, but working in the shadow of Yucca Mountain at the Nevada test site. I spent a good fraction of my life trying to open Yucca Mountain. And I'm to the point of recognizing that we have got to move ahead in this country. And I appreciate that the Blue Ribbon Commission has laid out a blueprint that I think can allow us to move ahead. Uh, the administration published a strategy in January that largely followed the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations. Um, four senators, uh, um, and they um, encouraged input from Secretary Moniz, have now come forth with a bill that uh, is consistent with the administration strategy, generally consistent with the Blue Ribbon Commission, starting in the debate in the Congress. I view that bill as the best chance we've had in decades actually move ahead on the back end of the fuel cycle. Uh, the importance of interim storage, the importance of a consent-based process are going to be absolutely vital if we can move ahead. And without it, I truly believe that we run the risk of strangling nuclear power in this country on its own waste. And uh, that would be a crisis of just incredible proportions. So I appreciate your, your emphasis on moving on the back end of the fuel cycle, um, I couldn't agree more. We have to do it. We must do it if I think any of the other aspects in your report are going to come to pass. So I'll, I'll be joining you in praying that uh, Congress does see fit to move ahead and give us, the, uh, give us the legislative basis that we need. But in general, my compliments. I'll really be looking forward to your thoughts on the SMRs. Um, and we'll just thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Other comments or questions? In the back, white shirt. Wait for a microphone, please. Thanks very much. Um, excellent panel. Thank you. My name is Con Nugent. I run the Heinz Center for Science, Economics, and the Environment. I belong to that club, or maybe faction is the better word, of environmentalists who like nuclear power. Um, uh, so my question, therefore, is, is a follow-up from my own uh, 
uh, institutional and personal political position. In your, I think, uh, astute observation of the need to monetize some of the less easily calculated benefits of nuclear power, and in your section of the report having to do with tax policy, why, oh why, uh, can't you come out in favor of a carbon tax and make league with the enviros who care so deeply about it and, um, and act whereby you could transform, you'll forgive me, your old boy rather uh, uh, clubbish atmosphere and go on the side of youth and energy and a concern for the future of the planet. Here's your big chance, and in two pages of recommendations, you avoid the carbon tax as if it were the bubonic plague. Tell me about it. <laughs> Boy, I wish I could push that off to somebody else. Um, well, the, the simple reality was in uh, a few areas, that being one, as we came together with the recommendations for our report, uh, we have a diverse set of individuals represented on the commission. Everybody is not of a like mind. That may not be a surprise to you, but that's the reality of where we are. So in some instances, uh, like revisions to the tax code, we identify that as the obvious lever that can be used uh, and did not take it more granularly to exactly define what ought to be done. Policy uh, leaders, that's not a new idea hardly. Uh, it's well recognized as one of the options that could be used. Uh, and our intent was to not over constrain uh, the administration or the legislators in exactly how to move forward, uh, but rather identify the areas of lever uh, where obviously they could move forward. This now, as well, as we go forward, and last part of my response. With our uh, discussions among policy leaders within uh, the administration and staff and the like, uh, we, we well have the opportunity to express much more detail about how some of those levers uh, might be used. Uh, but at this point in time, that's why we stopped where we did. Good. Dick, go ahead. I'd like just to add one thought uh, to reinforce the statement you made. I think we're at a, my personal view is that we are at a time where one of the great challenges for our generation to confront is climate change. Uh, and there is a need for an alliance between those who want to deal with climate change and the environmental community to join forces with those who can help to address that problem. And that includes the nuclear industry. And if there has been a tradition in the past of opposition. I think that if one looks at the risks associated with nuclear power, power associated compared to the risks from climate change. There's no question in my mind as to where you put your money. And I think that there is a real need for a alliance of interests across communities that have often found it difficult to work in the past. And I'd like to emphasize and agree uh, very strongly with that aspect of your, of your comments. So would I. But I'm at CSIS, so I go at it a little differently. Yep. Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. I'd like to laud you for your efforts today. I think this is very important and also very timely. I might even say it's, it's about time. Uh, because uh, we are behind the curve on this. And there are just a couple of things I'd like to add. You mentioned the, the issue about the restrictions. I think a lot of what has been done, uh, building a nuclear power plant, of course, uh, is largely uh, uh, determined by the costs and the time. And the costs and the time have become uh, increasingly so with a lot of the regulations, a lot of which has to do with the security. But because it was in a climate where you had very strong anti-nuclear feelings when a lot of this stuff was put through, a lot of it probably should be re-looked at to see if it actually does have something to do with the security. And if not, then as I think you mentioned in your comment, Mr. Wallace, that uh, it, should be, uh, it should be put aside to make things a lot easier to produce these things. A couple of things I'd just like to say. If the United States, the reason we uh, nuclear energy is so important is that there is a renaissance at the, at the present moment. We are in the nuclear age. 
with a population of six billion people and, and increasing, uh, nuclear is really going to be the only solution. The solar plants and the windmills are all very good, but they're not going to support a population that size. Nuclear can do the job. And if the United States is going to uh, become or remain a leader, depending on you see it, a lot of the new advances have got to also begin taking place in the United States. And I'm thinking in particular about high temperature reactors. Uh, I would even mention the, the issue of uh, breeder reactors, although I know that's pretty controversial. But there is stuff going on in places like China and France for these the new generation uh, that uh, the United States also should be involved in. And the second thing I like to mention is a concept friends of mine at Fusion uh, Magazine and 21st Century Science had 30 years ago about what was called a nuplex. That is, you have a nuclear power plant and you use the heat that's coming off of it for desalination. That is, you get a, a whole complex of things that are necessary that, that are beneficial and the nuclear plant becomes the center of that. I think that would be very important also to look back at this nuplex comp uh, concept when you're uh, working on, on developing your program. That's Okay, thanks very much, Bill. Sure. Other comments or questions? Uh, yes. Uh, Ken Meyer, Court, World Docs. On uh, page uh, 14 of your report, you say, as shown in the below chart, uranium ore is widely distributed across the globe. I haven't been able to find the chart, so maybe you could just tell me <laughs> where the uh, uranium ore is located and is uh, the source fuel for the reactors at all an issue? The availability of the source fuel. Okay, you got us. <laughs> I'm not quite sure the answer to that. It may be that in the editing process, somewhere in the end, we, that chart was actually dropped out. Uh, but thanks for pointing that out to us. Yeah. <laughs> Annie. Response. Identify yourself. Yes. Henry mentioned me earlier. Uh, my job has since changed. That's a little dated. I've been working back in the House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, since last March, so a little over a year. Uh, but Annie Caputo with the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, with all due respect to my friend Pete Lyons and members of the Blue Ribbon Commission, I have to point out that 335 members this week, twice, voted in favor to continue the path forward with Yucca Mountain. That's a pretty profound statement. More Democratic members voted in favor of pursuing Yucca Mountain than voted against it. That combined with the remand from the courts to the NRC of its waste confidence decision in the wake of the president's decision to cancel the program leaves us with a moratorium on licensing at the NRC. Licensing, in fact, that includes dry cast storage or, or uh, extended licenses for existing dry cast storage facilities. So this leaves us in quite a bind when we have courts who seem to view waste confidence as resting on disposal, not storage, being the crux to that issue, and the fact that we are going from a license application that was mostly reviewed and scuttled at the last minute, and interim storage, which doesn't seem to meet the court's intent, and a strategy out of DOE that suggests maybe we'll have a repository in 2048, and how would a theoretical progress toward a 2048 repository satisfy a court that chided the NRC for doing nothing more than hoping for a repository. I guess to a certain extent, I just have to ask, how, how does the Blue Ribbon Commission report really address that position in the House? Well, let me say, first of all, with regard to Yucca Mountain, the Blue Ribbon Commission was very careful to say that we were not a siting commission. And we made recommendations about how to proceed without prejudice to any site that would come forward and that could be licensed under that approach. 
particularly emphasizing the consent-based approach. And if Yucca Mountain were the site, there was nothing in the report that said that that was inappropriate. We just had a certain process that we thought should be followed and was, in our view, essential to succeed in being able to complete the licensing process. With regard, this report, uh, I think, mentions the waste confidence rule in, uh, in passing. I know the NRC has been, has established a deadline within which it intends to uh, have a new waste confidence rule in place. It's my understanding that the, if the NRC is able to comply with that deadline, and I believe they're on track at the moment from what I've read recently, uh, that it will not adversely affect any uh, licensing, uh, the timeliness of licensing actions. Uh, and I, 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 you know, obviously the NRC has been directed to consider uh, the current situation with regard to uh, the development of a repository. And I presume that this, that the draft rule, which will go out for, for comment, will present the case as to why a waste confidence rule is appropriate under the circumstances. I can't, I'm not in a position to be able to argue the case one way or another without seeing how they address it. But that obviously is something that the NRC is grappling with right now. Ed, wait for a mic, if you will, Ed. Ed Davis with the Pegasus Group. Uh, the uh, charter going forward, I'm wasn't quite sure. You mentioned uh, nuclear energy's benefits to uh, grid stability. Question earlier mentioned uh, nuclear energy's uh, benefits to uh, climate, and certainly uh, nuclear energy's benefits for uh, national security. It seems to be a cross-cutting issue. I'm wondering, is that something that the uh, CSIS, its nuclear program, is going to be looking at, how to effectively monetize those benefits so they can be recognized to build a business case for going forward with nuclear power? Yeah, great question, Ed. <clears throat> so in the way that I outlined in just short order the topics we're going to go after, uh, I called the first general topic follow-up to this report, uh, and then I chose to give the example of uh, the uh, uh, stability and reliability of the grid, more work needing to be done on that. In fact, there are a number of other similar issues that get at the benefits of commercial nuclear energy, uh, and the need to begin to put some monetary value to it for the sake of understanding the impact. Uh, and uh, we would expect to be doing that as, as time goes on. The, uh, to be perfectly candid with the whole group here, the challenge we face is this report is a great foundation. It opens up about 20 more studies that ought to be done. Uh, and so our challenge is to try and be very focused so as to undertake activity that that can make a difference in the soonest uh, time frame that's reasonable. So I'm, I just don't want to build up expectations uh, because there is a, there's a practical approach to what we can do, but that is recognized uh, as a, among uh, the activities that we can do following on to this report. Far side. Uh, hi, excellent discussion. Andy Patterson with the Atlantic Council and formerly with DOE on the business case for nuclear power. The study says that nuclear power is not economic on page 39, if I read your analysis. Basically, there isn't enough return for investors is what you're saying, even with the sensitivity analysis at the low capital cost. And here we go with 90% of our U.S. utilities are basically on the sidelines with cheap gas and no load growth. So one wonders if the challenge isn't as much the utilities themselves that are on the sidelines and risk averse with thinly capitalized balance sheets compared to our international competitors, as much as it is a federal government that is sequestered and gridlocked. So if you get it to the end of your analysis a year from now, and basically you've got 90% of the utility sector still on the sidelines, but let's just say the 10 COLs are placeholders. There's no serious investment plan behind those 10 COLs that are on, on, on order. Where do we turn to then? I'll only highlight a couple of the issues that are uh, among the recommendations that we have in there. And uh, one, 
the potential to expand foreign ownership in nuclear plants uh, we think is uh, something that ought to be more seriously considered with U.S. entities still maintaining the operational control. Uh, second, the tax code. Uh, there are opportunities uh, within the tax code uh, to do things that, that can be um, helpful as well. Uh, third, we talked about the externalities. Uh, in, in some cases, the problem is not just the cost, but it's the ability to get confidence in the revenue. Uh, and so to the extent that there are uh, abilities to establish, uh, for example, power purchase agreements uh, through Department of, of Defense or federal facilities, uh, that's, that's uh, keenly important. Um, as an individual who, as many of you know, was very involved with the uh, five years ago aspiration that we couldn't build these new plants fast enough when we had gas at eight to ten dollars a million BTU, um, uh, you know, we well understand uh, the economics, and so what's now needed are gap closing, gap closing measures that make sense in the context of uh, fiscally constrained government. So uh, creativity along the lines of the items that I put out, and there are likely others as well uh, that need to be further pursued. I'm going to take maybe just uh, two more uh, comments or questions. Yes. I, Sam Letter with FEPC. Uh, in the report, you mentioned uh, the importance of the industrial linkages between Japanese industry and the United States industry, G. Hitachi, Toshiba Westinghouse. How important is it for Japan to stay in the nuclear industry, both on the technology side and the operator side, for U.S. interests? Thank you. Uh, that is not a subject that's dealt with in this report. Um, and I can give you a personal perspective on this. Um, Japan has about had, before the Fukushima accident, about 30 percent of its power provided from nuclear, and the plans were to try to grow to 50 percent. And that reflected the reality that uh, Japan has no indigenous uh, supplies of energy, and so part of their security was essentially dependent on, uh, on nuclear power, and they viewed it that way. Um, at the moment, two nuclear power plants of the 50 remaining are operating. Uh, I understand within the last week or so, 10 plants have filed for restart, but there is a process that involving an entirely new regulator that was established in Japan that will have to evaluate those plants. Uh, this obviously is a matter of the Japanese how to decide to uh, how to proceed and how much reliance they should have on nuclear power. I think we have to recognize, however, that uh, Japan is an enormously important ally to the United States in that region. And it's an enormously important region for our economic and national security. Uh, if Japan has to continue to import expensive fossil fuels, they are at a competitive disadvantage economically. You know, where we're paying you know, four or five dollars for a million BTU for natural gas now, and they're paying 14 or 15 dollars. That just folds into the factor costs for their production. It's in our interest that Japan remains strong economically because an important ally of ours in that region. And if they're not able to find a way to get some nuclear power plants operating, where the economics are entirely different between fossil and nuclear there, and the strategic elements of this play into that, then uh, from my personal view, we have the perspective that we need to worry about Japan being able to maintain its significance and its role in the region. So I think there are real stakes for the United States in trying to help the Japanese work their way through this problem. It's their decision, obviously, about the extent to which they rely on nuclear power, but it is in our interest to help them. And from my personal point of view, we'd like to find a way that they could get some of these plants started again and continue to, um, their reliance on nuclear power is important for us. That's not a matter that's dealt with in this report, um, but it is something I've, I've spent time in Japan and have strong views on it. Uh, I would just like to add that the initial reaction in Japan after Fukushima 
uh, by the prime minister was, we're going to close down our nuclear industry. They backed away from that now, I think, prudently. Okay, last, John, give you the final word. Uh, John Welch with USEC. Uh, I greatly applaud the efforts that you're doing. I think you're uh, addressing areas, again, another person that's worked in the industry for 40 years, care about it uh, tremendously. The, um, there is a tremendous time urgency relative to the existing fleet, in my view. <clears throat> The fact we lost Kiwani should be a real eye-opener. One of the best operating plants that we have in the country. They know how to do it and do it right. And yet, uh, the, the market that they're playing in, you know, it was a prudent decision on Dominion's part to go do that. I think there are more plants just like that. Uh, I think the nuclear utilities are fighting for their lives from a cost standpoint on that. And so some of this policy level uh, decision making is important near term or we're going to wake up four or five years from now and, I, and we'll be longing for 100 operating nuclear power plants. It'll be a much reduced number. You're already seeing it in the, the lack of upgrades that are going on. I'd reinforce for um, Dr. Lyons, we're the best operators, the best maintainers, and we need to solve the fuel problem. But if we're going to be a leader in this long term, we have to be a leader in the technology. You can't be, you know, that's where all the brains, all the smarts comes from is the development and deployment of the technology. So a robust nuclear energy investment program on technology is very important. We need to figure out what should be more governmental as opposed to commercial uh, and then manage it accordingly. But my biggest fear is that stuff's happening in real time. And I think that you all become a very important forum for putting that sense of urgency into the process. Again, I commend you for your work. Thanks, John. I, I think that was poignant. Uh, the, the sense of urgency is why we are all here and why we establish, as if you will, this report as the foundation upon which we now quickly move forward in those areas where we think we can, we can make the most difference. Uh, and, uh, but that's not done uh, by a small group working in isolation. Uh, you all understand the CSIS process of uh, collaboration and facilitation and getting good input to develop uh, the materials to educate and the recommendations which are grounded on good fact-based fact analysis. That's how we will seek to go forward. And uh, many of you in the room have helped us in the past two years. To, to all of you and, and those not here uh, who were part of the process, I want to express my gratitude uh, this report is the product of, uh, uh, I don't know, thousands of man hours worth of, uh, of discussion and deliberation and input uh, and analysis, and it's appreciated. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues here at the commission uh, and uh, uh, General Scowcroft in particular for asking the two provocative questions two years ago that got us down this path. I don't know that we fully answered them, General, but hopefully we've taken a big step in the direction. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to come uh, and help us um, spread the word. Last note, uh, thank you, just one more. So you have the hard copies of the report. It's also available online at csis.org forward slash programs, nuclear energy programs. So feel free to push it out uh, to all your colleagues. Thanks very much.